my, my name is Rob, by the way. I'm one of the systems engineers who covers New England for Extreme Networks. And you know, we're fortunate that we get to cover you know, the whole breadth of networking. We do everything from switching to routing, and we do a lot of work in the Wi-Fi space. And a couple of years ago, I, I, I came from a history of being a switching guy, right? Switching and routing were my happy space. People would talk about Wi-Fi. I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and probably about five or six years ago, I had a customer look at me and say, I think I bought my last campus switch. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, the other day I was walking through my development environment. I looked at somebody's desk and they had their laptop sitting on the desk, not three inches from the RJ45 connector on the laptop was the wire that was going into that switch port that I was paying all kinds of money for. And I realized they're just connecting to the Wi-Fi. Nobody's really using that wired network anymore. And that has been a continuing trend that we've seen for the last, what, five, six, maybe even 10 years, is we're seeing the steady migration of consumption. We're moving away from those fixed devices, those wired devices that are physically plugged into a wall, right? And what we're migrating towards is we're migrating towards much more of a wireless universe, and we're migrating towards much more of a battery operated universe. Um, and so what they kind of asked me to talk about was we're doing one of our generational changes in Wi-Fi right now, right? It's, it's that migration from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6. And this isn't the first time, I mean, you can tell by the number, right? It's not Wi-Fi 2. Um, we've done this migration before. This is not an earth shattering thing, but it's really good to see what are some of the things that we're doing with networks to try to evolve as an industry to be able to support more than what we've been doing in the past, right? So my first question for you, I have, I have a trivia question. Which one of these two vehicles is faster? And if you can't figure out where I'm going here, you, you maybe need another cup of coffee, right? Right? The trivia, the, the, the follow-up question is, well, how many people do you need to move? Right? If I've got 50 people, I'm taking the school bus, right? If there's only two of us, you know, let's go driving. And that's really what's happening inside of Wi-Fi. Historically, we've always been focused on bandwidth. How much bandwidth can I see? You hear everybody talking about, well, we do 256 QAM, we do 1024 QAM. We're all about the speeds and you know, how fast things can happen. And the reality is the speed of Wi-Fi is not the problem. First of all, the average company has about two dozen access points for every gigabit of internet bandwidth. And everything I've been hearing about here is all about everything moving to the cloud, right? What does that mean? the vast majority of the data that companies are generating are going up through that through that um you know that internet connection even when you work from home you're not governed by how fast your access point is right you're governed by two things one is going to be how big is your internet pipe on your end and of course on the other end right um but you're also going to be governed by how available is the frequency space that you need to use to connect using wi-fi and that's kind of where um, the Wi-Fi 6 and the Wi-Fi 6E standards have come in and says, what are the problems that we're trying to solve, right? They looked at it and they said, well, obviously, you know, everybody wants something that's faster. So there is a throughput component to Wi-Fi 6. But the really big things that we're looking at are capacity. It's not how fast do the cars go down the highway. It's how many cars can we get down the highway, right? Battery life because the majority of devices now that are connecting to Wi-Fi are laptops, our tablets, our, our mobile devices, our scan guns, our you know, IoT devices that, 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 that consume batteries, right? And then of course, there's always that security component, which, which is hiding behind the curtain, right? Do we have an opportunity here to do an upgrade? If you think about Wi-Fi, right? Much more so than any other technology is we live in a world of backwards compatibility. Right, I can go all the way back to 1997 when they came out with the very first 802.11 specification with this two megabit um, system and it operated in the 2.4 gigabit gigahertz uh, ISM band right and as we've gone on and almost immediately they updated to Wi Fi one, but it had to be backwards compatible. Right. And likewise, at the same time, they added some five gigahertz support, right? But as time has gone on, every new technology that has come out, right, has had to be backwards compatible to those previous systems. And I remember one time I started out as a technical trainer and I was down south and I talk like I'm from New England, right? I can talk quickly and energetically and everything else. And this guy who's sitting in the class, and he looks up at me, raises his hand, 
And he said, son, I was younger then, I had hair. <laughs> son, you talk faster than I listen. And I will never forget that. And that's how Wi-Fi works, right? If I go out there and I, if I, if I go into a warehouse, right? Warehouses are one of the hardest places to, to wire or to you know, set up for Wi-Fi. Um, if I go into a warehouse, one of the biggest problems is they're probably still using those Motorola scan guns from 1999. And those Motorola scan guns are connecting using you know, Wi-Fi zero or Wi-Fi one type of bit rates, right? And what that means is all the broadcast and all the multicast traffic that goes across the network has to be sent at that slower rate. And when those clients talk, they talk slowly. They consume a lot of frequency time. And everybody else is queued up, waiting to go, trying to get some work done, right? And there's an inability of them to be able to, be able to do what they're doing because of those few clients that, that are running a little bit slower, right? So a couple of things about Wi-Fi 6, right? Well, one thing is, is we get some new spectrum out of here, right? If you've heard about Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 6E brings us into the six gigahertz spectrum, which has just been made available by the Federal Communications Commission. Right, it is a huge amount of bandwidth, which is going to really help us at least for a little while. Right, at some point we're going to fill it up, and I'm sure we'll have to go to some other spectrum as well. Um, but for right now, we have a really great opportunity to go get some greenfield spectrum. Right, so so that's that's one of the nice things. Another nice thing about Wi-Fi 6E is it doesn't have to be backwards compatible. That means we don't have to support those earlier devices from. 1997 or 1999 that are running on our environment. Now, at some point, yes, we're going to get there, right? In 20 years, we'll be looking back. Remember in you know, 2022 when you know, Wi-Fi 6E came out. Um, but, but for right now, we have a green field spectrum, right? We also, so we have a lot of new spectrum. I already mentioned that, right? And we also have a number of built-in technologies here that are going to really help us solve those battery and capacity problems, okay? So what are some of those, th th those things? Well, the big one is something called OFDMA, right? And what OFDMA does is it allows us to take the channel and break the channel up very efficiently into what we call resource units. And so the idea is that we can have multiple conversations within the same channel and the resource units are, 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 are flexible in terms of how much bandwidth is being allocated to a speaker. And so the result is, is we're able to send traffic simultaneously. We have multiple lanes now that we didn't have in the past, right? Another thing, Dave and I were sitting over, by the way, Dave back here is the, uh, the account manager. We were sitting back there with our Wi-Fi spectrum analyzer, right? And, and we were noticing how many different devices are on the same channels here in, in, just in this facility, right? You have a lot of access points in a hotel. Um, and the challenge is, is only one device can talk at a time on a channel. Well, pretty much, right? You ever go to a rock concert? Can multiple people talk at the same time in a rock concert, right? Everybody's like screaming at each other and having a great time. And, and it's good because, you know, you're talking to the person that's closest to you and somebody's over there having a conversation. And yeah, you can maybe hear each other or hear the music, but, you know, you've got enough signal that they understand what you're, what you're trying to say. Right. Um, and the same thing's true with Wi-Fi is, is if you're in a quiet room and everybody's supposed to be listening to, you know, listening to me, it, if a small conversation in the back of the room could be seen as being disturbing. But if we're in a room where everybody's having a one on one conversation at a cocktail party or something, right, it's OK for me to talk over the person who's in, in the other conversation as long as I don't talk too loudly. And so one of the big things that we're, we're coming out with is something called BSS color. Right, is the idea that what we, we can actually identify when a client speaks, which AP is that client speaking to, so that we can decide whether or not we have to give way to that client or whether we can go ahead and, and speak simultaneously. Right. And there are other technologies that, that are kind of big. One of the big ones is target wake time, is a great way in which we can control when, when does a wireless device have to actually listen to the frequency? When are its packets going to show up? And that why that's powerful is when I have a battery operated device, it allows me to turn the, the receiver on and off. So I'm not consuming battery power 24 7, 365. I can actually get some, get, 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 get some pauses. And there's other things in there, right? We have multi user MIMO and beam forming and, <coughs> and, and larger, um, larger channels. Um, but this is some great technology which really allows us to improve the capacity of the system in terms of the number of clients. 
And then what it also does is it, is it, is it ensures that the, the batteries are, are as functional as possible. So I mentioned a little bit about um, spectrum, right? Um, if we go back, anybody who's been around Wi-Fi for a while immediately knows in the 2.4 gigahertz space in the US, based on the ISM band, the way it's licensed, there's channels one through 11, and really you can use channels one, six, and 11, right? Because everybody else kind of overlaps with each other. Um, and so we have three functional 20 megahertz channels, and that's all you get. In theory, I can show you in a two-dimensional space how I can lay them out in these perfectly octagonal or circular cells and everything works beautifully. Um, unfortunately, most buildings have walls in them. Um, unfortunately, most buildings have more than one floor and the whole system kind of falls down to the point where there's tons and tons of co-channel interference, right? We went ahead and added five gigahertz a number of years ago. And five gigahertz was huge, um, but it really only has about nine channels, right? Some folks do. Some folks go out there and they leverage you. If you look here on the slide, right? I've got all these orange channels and that one red channel, right? Those orange channels and the red channel are what we call the dynamic frequency selection range, right? And it means that they overlap with things like, you know, radar sets. And so we can use the channels as long as there's no radar around. And I did notice it here at, uh, here at the Sheridan Hotel, they're not using those channels. It may be the proximity of Logan, perhaps that sets off a lot of DFS problems, I'm not sure. Um, but unless you're willing to go into the DFS range, which requires you have devices that are, you know, no, that are certificated for it and that you know what you're doing and you actually are, you know, planning a little bit, um, you still have very few channels. This is a huge issue, right? I was talking to somebody today, you know, talking about laboratory space. You can have, especially in a place like Boston, you can have hundreds of access points all over the place, right? And what are they doing? They're all contending with each other for those same scarce channels, which creates a lot of a problem. Okay. And then we get other cases where you get your Comcast, your Xfinity modems, or your, your different, you know, I, I, I've seen the iPhone 12. Somebody here had an iPhone 12, which is trying to use four channels at the same time. Um, it gets a little excessive, right? So what's really nice here is with um, Wi-Fi 6E, we now have access to 59 brand new 20 megahertz channels. Um, it's not going to solve all of our problems, but it's going to make it a lot easier, right? A lot easier to find channels that are not being used elsewhere as we move around. It would be very reasonable to expect in a hotel like this that we could have an access point in every room and have the access points not contending with each other and virtually eliminate co-channel interference, right? Okay. Now, the challenge, of course, with Wi-Fi is it's all about range, right? How much area can I cover from a single radio? And, and if you've been around the space for a while, you realize as frequency goes up, that first meter propagation goes down, right? So we lose the ability to ex expand, uh, to cover based on frequency, right? 2.4 gigahertz covers better than, remember the old 900 megahertz phones? It would go forever, right? Then we went to 2.4 gigahertz and it got a little bit smaller. Then we went to five gigahertz, it got smaller still. And here we are at six gigahertz, it's a little bit smaller still, right? And so what I did was I did a little mock-up. This is just a predictive analysis. This is, is not real world data. Um, but what, what I did was I, tried, I, I was simulating kind of the worst Wi-Fi experience that I work with, which is schools that were built circa 1967 when we were convinced that the, the, the Russians were gonna send nuclear missiles our way and we had to turn every school into a fallout shelter, right? They were designed to stop radiation, not to permit it. Um, and you can see the difference in the propagation. There's a huge difference between 2.4 and five. There's a small difference between five and six, right? But it's a little bit, you may find that you need to put an AP in a hallway or you may need to put, put a couple of extra APs in there um, as we move on. One of the other big differences, I know I'm getting into the bad news here, right? One of the other big differences is around um, what we're allowed to do with these access points, right? Um, six gigahertz has incumbent licensed users. There are people out there using that six gigahertz space. Now, that being said, the FCC is doing a good job of trying to migrate those users into different frequency bands, 
but we still need to make sure that we understand what's going on. So right now today, you're only able to buy indoor Wi-Fi 6 access points or 6E access points, right? Um, by the way, you can buy Wi-Fi 6 access points that are outdoors and doing all kinds of stuff. They're just gonna be limited to the 2.4 and five gigahertz spectrums, okay? But what you can do we, 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 with those Wi-Fi 6E access points, the six gigahertz ones, we have got a number of new rules that we have to follow as a manufacturer. One, we're limited to a maximum um, you know, EIRP of 30 dBm, right? Um, number two, they have to be installed indoors, right? It, it is technically illegal to take one of them, put them in a NEBA enclosure and hang them outside because you run the risk of causing that, causing that interference. Um, as a manufacturer, we're not allowed to sell access points that are weatherized that are intended for indoor use. Why? Well, if we weatherize them, they're likely to end up outdoors. Um, we're not allowed to put them in a vehicle unless it's an airliner flying above 10,000 feet. Um, we're not allowed to give you battery power, well, except for backups, right? Um, and we're not allowed to give you external antennas, right? The first six of those are probably not that big of a deal, right? The last one is turning into a little bit of an issue because we deal with a lot of spaces where for aesthetics reasons or acoustics reasons or, you know, environmental reasons, we don't want to put the access point in the room. And traditionally what we've always done is put a rate an antenna in the room that we're trying to feed and hang the access point out. But the reason for the no external antennas is because people cheat a lot and put, you know, put that super duper Wi-Fi, you know, that high gain antenna on the powerful access point. And we would, we would not be able to ensure that folks um, stick with that 30 dBm limit, right? Coming soon, we're going to be able to support outdoor access points. And when that happens, the, the, the sticking point here, which is making it a little bit challenging, is we're going to have to use something called automatic frequency coordination. And that just simply means when you install the outdoor access point, the access, access point is going to have to know where it is and is going to have to make sure that it's not con, um, conflicting with any licensed. Uh, services and the way it does that is going to call home to the basically to the FCC, and the FCC is going to say, "Yep, you can use at that location. You can use that frequency, but you can't use this other frequency." Okay. Another big part to Wi-Fi six E is um, is is a change in security. Right, we're always trying to advance security. Security is always you know what what's secure today is going to be exposed tomorrow. We we all know that we've seen that. Uh, routinely. Um, and in Wi-Fi, you know, we, we, we've gone down quite the chain of different security standards, right? We started out with WEP, wired equivalent privacy. Well, yeah, the wired was never all that secure. So I guess we, I guess we met the goal, right? Um, WPA came out in 2003, right? Both WPA and WEP are, have been easily hacked, right? Uh, WPA2 came out very quickly after WPA. <laughs> Right, right. Um, in 2004, we've been running pretty much unchanged, other than you know we we moved from TKIP to CCMP, um, but pretty much unchanged in WPA2 since 2004. And 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 WPA2 is not broken, right? You can have a secure network with WPA2, but it's also not perfect, right? It's got a couple of issues. Um, one is there's no rate limiting on the authentication checks, and so it's open to brute force attacks. Right. If you just iterate through all the different keys, eventually you're going to get the right key. Um, it's also it's a key based system, which means that it's rel if you know the key, it's relatively easy to go in there and actually um, you know, decrypt traffic. Right. And then the last one is on an open SSID, you know, you go into Starbucks or you come here. Right. We're connecting on an open SSID here. Is your data encrypted? No. Right. And so that's one of the big. So, so we, you know, at the same time as Wi Fi 6E, the WPA3 working group has been working, and the decision was made that Wi Fi 6E will no long, will not support WPA2. You're going to be required to use WPA3, um, you know, if, if you're going to run Wi Fi 6E. This is a little bit of a challenge. And the reason it's a little bit of a challenge is that we want to make sure that folks are. Um, you know, the legacy clients are able to talk on the new network. And a lot of the older clients only support WPA2. 
And so what we've been able to do is build systems that allow us to automatically select on a per client basis, whether we use WPA2 or WPA3. And then obviously when they go to Wi-Fi 6E, they have to use WPA3. Okay. Um, another big change that's happened, you know, inside of WPA3 is this thing called OWE, which is, um, you know, opportunistic wireless encryption, open SSIDs are not encrypted. We've kind of divorced authentic authorization from the encryption side of it. Okay. Um, I'm being told I need to need to move things along. Be aware that we do have a lot of clients out there already. There are a lot of access points out there already. We already do have that rogue access point and rogue client risk associated with it. So being sure that we get our whips and widths up to speed is probably going to be important, right? And then I would, I you know, I've tried not to make this a sales pitch, but I have to give at least a little bit of a sales pitch. We do have the AP4000. I believe it was the industry first six gigahertz access point, at least at the enterprise inter, inter, enterprise level. Um, it works with both our cloud-based management, which if you want to hear about Extreme Cloud IQ, we would love to talk to you about it over at the booth. Um, and then we also have our XIQ controller, which is an on-prem system, which works very much the same way. So I know I'd love it if you came over and talked to us. I know Dave, Dave O'Brien over there in the corner would love it if we came over and talked to us. Um, does anybody have any questions? Good stuff.